everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ben Amherst, call sign K0BJJ, and you're watching Spotter Jetting Amateur Radio. Today we are going to be talking about team storm spotting and team storm chasing. Now right out of the gate, I want to tell you my definitions of a storm spotter and a storm chaser. A storm spotter is someone who knows the area, probably from the area, they report to National Weather Service and or local authorities either individually or through in that control. A storm chaser is someone not necessarily from the area. They try, tend to travel great distance fo following weather phenomenon, whether it be tornadoes, severe storms, fires, aval, um, winter storms, you name it. The weather phenomenon's there, they're going to get the story. They are more of weather reporters. They may or may not report to National Weather Service or, Na or 911. They are out there for some kind of personal gain, whether that be monetary, whether that be fame, who knows? They are out there for some kind of personal gain. Now, some storm chasers will say that they are out there for the people, and some storm chasers are out there gathering science. That does not change the fact that they are traveling great distances and they may or may not know the areas that they're in. A storm spotter will know the areas that, the, that they are in because they are spotting at home. With that, I want to get down into Aries Skywarn. Now I'm going to break down Aries Skywarn into two basic kinds of approaches. Now these approaches can flow within the same team, within the same activation, depending on the team. We're going to organize these into unorganized and organized appropriately. An unorganized team will operate in more of an all hands on deck kind of operation. They're spotters. You cannot, don't have verifiable training. At least no one has the verified training. They might have training. They might not. There might be a mix of trained and untrained. They're net control operators. May or may not be taking accurate logs. And off those logs, it may not be submitting in paperwork afterwards any kind of report. These teams tend to focus on individual effort, what individuals are seeing on radar, and spread out. They, in the part people may or may not work as a team, as per se communicating with one another and organizing on a structure. They're, dis, they're a dysfunctional family, if you will, with the common goal of let's get people to safety, let's keep eyes on storms and keep people, get sirens going. They have a very, they have the common goal, but their approach is very scattered and disorganized. Now, an organized team will have SOPs in place dictating the approach to an activation. They will have verifiable training. On an organized team, you can go up to the coordinator, the EC, and say, I would like to see the training of your individuals, and they will be able to present you with some kind of document of the individual training. Now, they may not do that unless you have a reason to know. So, a sheriff's office, an EMA, the ARRL would all have reasons to know what the training of the individuals are, and your EC would probably gladly hand over that documentation to them. They're going to have a organized net control operator who's going to be taking detailed logs with timestamps. What happened? Who was there? Stuff in that nature. Was there an emergency? Did they call 911? All that is going to end up in a dispatch log or a net control log. And after that log is completed, a after action report or after action review will be written up. This after action report will then be submitted to agencies. So they may submit it to 911, the 911 dispatch center, the sheriff's office, the National Weather Service, their state areas organization. The paperwork from that activation will move on from them to somewhere else. They also may have a debriefing afterwards and in fact I encourage all areas organizations to have debriefings about what happened. They also may or may not have a meteorologist on the team. A meteorologist could tell their storm spotters hey the weather is moving into this area 
and this is where you need to organize up at. Also, those team members are going to work together in the field. I say a good team space is roughly one to, five, one to ten miles apart to keep multiple sets of eyes on one common storm. And that brings me into my layered approach at storm spotting, which we're going to have to get over to the computer for. And I will show you how a layered approach at storm spotting can keep an area safe with eyes on the storm consistently. Now the example we're going to look at is a six person team, one net controller and five spotters. But you should be able to get the point with such small numbers how this team can operate effectively. All right, everyone, we're going to talk about my layered approach at storm spotting at this point. I want to apologize for the, vo the volume and the voice change. You are currently on a gaming headset for this portion of the video. So this black line simulates a storm. It's coming from us from the southwest to the northeast. This is a pretty typical approach for storms that hit Jasper County. And it's about to affect the Jasper County area. We are going to deploy our storm spotters and our net control operator. Now our storm spotters got there really, really quick, almost instantly. But they're going to spot on the edge of the county to cover this storm no matter which way it shifts. Could shift further north, it could shift further east. Either way, these individuals are in an intercept position. Also, I'm going to want to highlight to where they are exactly with roads. They have a north, south, east, west option. Every one of them does. This east, west option, this east option's a little bit to the north here, but it's still there. And this south option is a little bit far away, but it's still there. This will allow these spotters to communicate with one another and shift according to the storm. One might have to evacuate their spotting location for safety. One may have to redeploy to get better eyes. They can communicate with one each another and they can cover the storm no matter what. They are also have a net control operator back here in the center of the county in Newton where they're going to be replaying their locations and what they're seeing. Now net control is in charge of contacting 911 or National Weather Service. Though these spotters will be able to as well if they need to. They just need to let net, their net control operator know if they do that so that way net control doesn't call those places with a double call on something. Now you might be sitting here I'm like, well this doesn't look like a layered approach. Well, we're getting to that because behind them we're going to have two more spotters. There are also going to be positions to where they can go north, south, east, west, relatively easy. But they're going to be 5 to 10 miles behind. So this one's off at a pull-off. He can run up 163, go down 163, get over north, south, highway 14. But these team members are going to adjust their positioning to these storms. And once the storms get past this first line, if the storms are moving slow enough, because we don't break the laws while we are storm spotting. They are going to go ahead and get around the storms while this line does their storm spotting operation. They are going to redeploy on the other side of the storm. Now, ideally, you have lines of spotters raced out, spaced out roughly 10 miles apart to cover your entire county. Obviously, with the six-person team here, you could do an adequate amount. So the bigger your team, the better you can organize. But that is my layered approach at storm spotting. And that brings me to storm chasers. Now, storm chasers might be out there with a noble goal in mind, such as collecting storm data. As you would see in the 1996 movie Sto uh, Twister, where these storm chase teams, these two storm chase teams, were out there trying to get a probe into a tornado that would release sensors so they could better understand how the tornado operates, how a tornado works. These, these teams were communicating 
via CB radio. So they were an organized storm chase team. Now, some storm chase teams might operate with a central hub in mind. If you ever watch Ryan Hall, y'all, on YouTube, which if you haven't checked it out, I would recommend doing. I, I watch Ryan Hall all the time. He goes out there on, on, on air and he's watching the radar. He is the central hub. He's got a series of storm chasers that he's working with and they can communicate within each other. If a chaser on the ground is seeing something, he can go, hey Ryan, I've got this on my camera right now. Or if he's not sure what he's seeing, hey Ryan, look at this storm over here. Let me know what you're seeing because he, doesn't, he isn't sure what he's seeing on the ground. They work as a team with a central hub together for these storms. Now Ryan's out there trying to get the word out on these storms. He's trying to get, be basically the TV weatherman without being the TV weatherman. He's out there broadcasting this so for people to watch to stay informed. Now his storm spotters he's working with may have different goals in, goals in mind. My definition of a storm chaser is someone that is out there for monetary or personal gain. Now, just because they are on the Ryan Hall, Ryan Hall go stream, doesn't mean that they are out there for a personal gain of some kind. With that, I want to thank you all for watching Spotter Judging Amateur Radio. If you haven't done it already, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this channel, we do amateur radio parks on the air activations, storm spotting, storm chasing in the central Iowa and Iowa area. If that is something you're interested in and you've made it to this point, you might as well click subscribe and you might as well hit that bell. With that, thank you for watching and don't forget to keep on spotting.